So we're, we're coming back to 1 Corinthians 14, but I want to remind you that the whole section, chapters 11 through 14, are about how the church is to gather together and build each other up. So you, you've probably heard from Austin's uh, message in chapter 12 and his announcement that we're, we're grateful to the Lord and looking forward to where he's leading us, to gathering uh, a, a sense of what God's next stage is for our church. And it's, it's a series or a season of vision development. So um, we're calling that advancing together because we, we really do want to hear from everybody. We want to, to sense uh, what God has in store for us. So a couple things I want to ask you to do. Number one, be in prayer for this as, as we gather um, God's wisdom and insights through, through the input of, of the body of Christ. Just pray that we as leaders can, can sort of, you know, somebody once said leadership is not seeing which way the herd is running and then just running out in front of them like, here we go, but a sense of a, of a moving forward together. And one of the ways that we've done that or are trying to do that is you've heard us repeatedly talk about focus meetings. In fact, um, there's probably already over 120 people signed up. Today's the first focus meeting. If you're not signed up, come again when you can't stay so long because you can't come to that one. It's, it's, it's full, which is a good thing. So what we would encourage you to do is to go online and register on the church website. We have about five or six different times, and we'd love to hear from everybody. There's three questions. They're really fruitful. We, we were meeting with some friends yesterday and just talking about those three questions. So if you have not yet signed up, be sure to sign up on the website. There's plenty of different dates and times. So we're looking forward to that. Pray for Austin, particularly, and our elders and leadership. Um, but we really do want to hear from you and move forward in a collaborative way. So this morning, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is a really cool passage because here we are 2,000 years later since the, the formation of, of the early church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Peter gets up and preaches. 3,000 people get converted. Now what? Well, one of the things that was clear is that the Lord wanted them to gather together. Okay, that, that's a no-brainer, okay? You don't just go home and go, well, it's just me and Jesus and my family. So right from the beginning in Acts chapter 2, it says, they, they gathered together. They continually devoted themselves to prayer and teaching and fellowship and the apostles, or I'm sorry, and the breaking of bread. So it, it's a, it's a non-negotiable that Christians gather. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise, ah, I don't need to go to church. I worship God on the deer stand, have a couple beers and shoot a deer. I'm like, that's, that's silly. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10 says this, do not forsake assembling together as is the habit of some. Now, in the first century, that verse was, was people were in the habit of stopping assembling because they were being persecuted. In our culture right now, people are forsaking gathering in America, not because they're being persecuted, but some of them because they like being in their pajamas. Bad reason, okay? Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone who's still watching us online or who doesn't go to church, it's because they just want to be in their pajamas. But there is a, a, a massive attrition in American churches right now. People are like, what happened since the pandemic? So please understand this. If you're a Christian, God insists for your benefit and the benefit of others that you continue to assemble with other Christians. That's a non-negotiable. And if you're not doing that on a regular basis, I can tell you, speaking for Christ, that you're not following the Lord's will for your life, okay? I don't mean that in a cruel way. I mean that in a positive way because we need that. So with all that being said, what do we do when we get together? And this chapter that we're going to look at is fascinating because when we read what they did compared to what we do, you're like, wait, what? Wow, we've, we've come a long way and maybe not always in a positive way. So remember that in the early church, they gathered in homes, okay? Now, so we're all familiar that this is not a church. This is a building. In fact, welcome, church. Thanks for coming into the building. The church is God's people. But apparently, as they met in different homes, there must have been some times where they would communicate one, with one another and say, hey, let's have a larger gathering. So, so Paul will use the phrase in, in this passage, when the whole church comes together. Now, I don't know if they... Clearly, they 
they weren't, you know, Joel Osteen's church. They didn't gather in, in the stadium. They didn't rent, you know, um, a big coliseum. But the Christians would come together on a regular basis. And in this passage, there's going to be two things that he's going to talk about. He says, we're talking about spiritual gifts. Communication is an important thing when you gather together. So he says, we need to talk about tongues and prophesying when you gather together. Now, again, some of you would be like, what? what? What are you talking about? So the idea of where we are now with a pulpit and, and the man of God and the man of the cloth, like, let's erase that from our mind. It was, it was believers gathered together. And interestingly, when believers gathered together, everybody had an opportunity to share, okay? So there was no such thing as going home going, I didn't get anything out of church because people would ask you, well, what did you bring? Did you share anything? So what we're going to see in this passage is an expression of how the early church gathered. And I think there's some positive things we can learn from that. It doesn't mean we need to burn down this building and go, this is stupid, we need to go back to home churches. But at least to go, okay, God, what, what is it that, that maybe we can improve on or, or correct our focus so that we can accomplish your goals? So I want to answer some preliminary questions before we read this passage because I think it will help. Number one, what are tongues? Because He's, he's going to mention in verse 2, one who speaks in a tongue, right? So what are tongues? The first time we see tongues in the New Testament is in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit appears above each believer with, with a, a tongue of fire, and then suddenly they begin to speak a language that they did not know. They were speaking the mighty deeds of God in languages that they had not learned. Meanwhile, the people who spoke those languages were shocked, like, how can he be talking to me when he doesn't speak my language? And so God used that as a sign in Acts chapter 2 to draw these people to listen, okay? So it was an earthly language, and it was a sign to draw people to listen to the gospel. However, many people insist that's the only thing it is. That is it. There's no other reason for tongues except to evangelize unbelievers by speaking a known earthly language. And I'm going to suggest clearly from 1 Corinthians 14 that that's not true, that there is a second function of tongues. First of all, look with me in chapter 14. And again, this is just preliminary. Look at verse 14. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So right there... Paul indicates that tongues is more than just uh, speaking German so German people can hear the gospel. It was also a prayer language, okay? And he says, in another part of this passage, that in tongues he speaks to God and he praises God, okay? So, what I want to indicate here is that tongues in the early church was not just for evangelism. I give, I grant that. But in this passage, Paul's telling Christians, when you come together, look at verse 26. What is the outcome when you assemble? Each one has a psalm, a revelation, a tongue, and an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So just briefly, let me say this. Paul's not saying tongues are a bad thing. In fact, what he appears to be saying is tongues is better for your private devotional time when you're speaking to God. Paul says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. And in my spirit, when I'm speaking in tongues, I'm speaking to God. But in public settings, he says, that shouldn't be the priority. So, two purposes of tongues. To evangelize unbelievers, but to edify Christians as long as it's interpreted. So it would look something like this. Someone would stand up and speak. They would say something, and they don't know what they said because Paul said in his spirit he speaks mysteries. And then someone else who had the gift of interpretation would stand up and say, this is what he said. Okay? And then Paul said, and the church would be edified. And he didn't forbid that. He said, look, you can do that to edify. So when people go, it's only for evangelism and earthly language, I'm going, it doesn't say that. Okay, now what about prophecy? What does he mean in this passage when he talks about prophesying? So, this chapter makes it clear that prophecy is not a prepared sermon because he is going to talk about instruction. But I don't think right now I'm prophesying, okay? 
But look with me in verse 3. He says, one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. Now, I'm assuming here that prophesying must have been some sort of spontaneous word that was given to God's people, okay? Now, it's not primarily a prediction about the future, okay? So if someone stood up, they wouldn't go, God told me there's going to be an earthquake tomorrow. Everybody needs to go up to Bowman's Hill or else we're all going to perish, right? It wasn't like that. But, but they would stand up and they would spontaneously share. Now, notice the goal, verse 3, for edification, that means to build up people, for exhortation, to stir up people, and then consolation, to comfort people, right? Now, you go, wait a minute. So, so, so anybody could just stand up and say, I have a word from the Lord? Yeah. Wait, could, couldn't that get dangerous? What if some wacko stands up and says, God told me we need to sell our stuff and go to Bowman's Hill? Well, later in the chapter, he says, the spirit of prophets is subject to the prophets. Now, a lot of people would say, hey, we can't allow that. We're going to have a bunch of crazy nuts. I think that's what was happening in the Thessalonian church. Because it is scary to allow people to just share something that they think the Lord has given them. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't despise prophetic utterances. But then he says, but examine everything carefully. Now, there would be many people who might say today, these things are not for today. We just have the Bible. So that's just, this is, that's, these are sign gifts for the first century. And I'm going, well... Let's be careful before, you know, people, people will say things to me like, wait, you think this is still for today? Prove it. And I go, wait, I, what do I need to prove? It says it in the Bible, right? So if you're going to prove that this should never happen today, you should prove it, right? Which, again, we can talk in more detail. I think there is a lot of nonsense and excess and weird stuff laying in the Spirit. But I think these two particular gifts, I'm not sure that it would be wise for us to simply say, oh, well, that's, that's not for today, okay? It's very different from the way we do things, but not necessarily wrong or not for today. Now, we do understand that at that time, they didn't have New Testaments, right? So, so when they gathered in the home, the homeowner didn't say, did anyone forget their Bible? And they would reach in and get a, a couple scrolls of, of the New Testament, or the Gideons would show up and go, here's a New Testament. So they didn't have any New Testament. And they, they actually, probably most of them didn't even have the Bible, right? Like these are expensive scrolls. It wasn't like the guys got, let me go get my scroll. So at best, if, if, if whoever was leading it would have read some scripture at the synagogue, or, or maybe they all shared some Old Testament scrolls, but they would come ready to, to teach and preach and, and share something. So, a couple background questions. The next question is this. Um, what are tongues? What is prophesying? What was the problem in the Corinthian assembly? The problem was when they were gathering together, they were all speaking in tongues at the same time, and it wasn't being interpreted. And Paul goes, we've got to stop that. He goes, that's not helpful because nobody knows what you're saying. So he says, let's dial down the tongues. They're not as important. Let's elevate the prophesying so that others can benefit. Okay? Then, another question we want to ask is this. What was the intended goal when they got together? Now look with me in chapter 14, and then we're going to read the passage. He says in, in verse 3, one who prophesies speaks to men for edification. Now, now make a note of that edification, building people up. Verse 4, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. That's second time. Verse 5, he says, now I wish you all spoke in tongues, but only if it's interpreted, look at verse 5, so that the church may receive edifying. You're like, Paul, I, I, I kind of get a sense that you're, you're, you're trying to make a point. Look at verse 12. So also, since you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. You're like, you think he's, think he's got trying to make a point here? Verse 17, you're giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. And then, just in case we missed it, look at verse 26. 
He says, so whenever you assemble, let all things be done for edification. You're like, okay, I get it. The goal when we gather is to build each other up in the Lord, okay? Now we ask this question, how does that happen? And this is the kicker. This is, this is what I'm going to try to unpack. Christians gather to build each other up through spirit-led, gospel-centered, all-inclusive praise, prayer, and instruction. I'm going to say that again. Christians gather together for the goal of edification. How do they do that? Through spirit-led, gospel-centered, all-inclusive, so it's not just a couple talking heads up here, communication for the purpose of edification, building up Christians, and evangelism of the lost. Because he's going to tell us here, hey, unbelievers come and gather at times, and, and we need to be conscious of that. So let's unpack that. Christians gather for spirit-led, all-inclusive gospel communication for edification and evangelism of lost people. All right, so we're going to look in verses 1 through 5. The first thing Christians do is they, they gather to build each other up. So getting ready for church takes on a new meaning. It's not like, ooh, you know. Um, somebody said to me, every time I'm down in the dumps, I get a new pair of shoes. I'm like, I was wondering where you get them. No, I didn't say that. So getting ready for church is not getting a new pair of shoes, right? Thanks. My Cairns students, they appreciate my humor. The rest of them, yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's look. He says, pursue love. Now remember, he has just, Pastor John just preached on this. He goes, gifts are important, but love's more important. Because even if you use your gifts, big deal if you don't love people. So pursue love, yet earnestly desire. Now notice he says spiritual now, the word gifts is in italics. Pursue love, but earnestly desire spiritual things, spiritual gifts, manifestations of the Spirit. So, are you ready for this? That's why I said when we gather, it needs to be Spirit-led. A.W. Tozer once said this, I think in America, the Holy Spirit could leave the, leave the church, and they probably wouldn't notice it for a couple months. Right? Are we dependent when we get together on Sunday mornings? Are we believing that the Holy Spirit is moving in our midst? Are we asking God to do that? So, he says... Desire earnestly these spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in tongues does not speak to men. Okay, so notice, this is that prayer tongue, but he speaks to God. No one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies, in other words, if you're communicating to other Christians, you can speak to them for edification, exhortation, and consolation. So think about this. Everybody here either needs to be built up, stirred up, or cheered up this morning. Some of you need to be built up in your faith. You don't know hardly anything, and you need to hear the word so you're not tossed all around. You need to be instructed. Some of you need to be stirred up, right? You, you, you got sin in your life, and you're not dealing with it, right? And some of you are beaten down, and you're struggling, and you're suffering, and you're hurting, and you need to be cheered up. So he says... These are the things we should focus on when we gather. But then in verse 4, he says, One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. I was taught by those who believe tongues are not for today that Paul's being pejorative here. That's why tongues are bad. You're edifying yourself, and you're not supposed to edify yourself. Gifts are to edify others. And I go, I don't think that's what he means. I think he means I pray in, I pray in a tongue, and, and, and I'm edified through that. I worship sometimes in tongues. And that builds up my faith. And you go, well, how can it build up your faith? You're not supposed to build up yourself. And I go, really? You need to read the book of Jude. He says, build yourself up in your most holy faith. So I think he's talking about in your private life, if you speak in a tongue, you edify yourself. But when you're gathered, he goes, you edify the church. So verse 5, I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. So remember, Paul's correcting a problem. They're gathering together. Ah, and he goes, let's stop that, and let's prioritize communication that people can understand and be edified. Okay? You go, all right, Paul, I'll start with that. Prophecy should take priority. 
But then number two, he says, listen, if we're going to edify one another, clarity is necessary. Clarity is necessary. How often have we said to somebody, well, if that's what you meant, why didn't you just say it? So look at verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you by way of a revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? He goes, it, it just, just, let's use some common sense here. He goes, let me just grab a couple analogies about how important clarity is. He says, for example, lifeless things like a flute or harp in producing a sound, if they don't produce a distinction in tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute on the harp? If I went over there and started playing the keyboard, I guarantee you, you would have no idea what I just played because I would have no idea what I just played. And then he says this, if the bugle sounds an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Like, like back then, they knew, you know, this, this you know, like, like today, you would know this. What does this mean? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. That's very different from like they they used bugles back then. They didn't have hey, will somebody turn the fire alarm down? And he goes, if somebody just gets up, like I don't get it. What 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 are you what are you saying? Verse nine. So you, unless you utter by tongue speech that is clear. Now that's the key, clear, understandable, right, intelligible. When I'm teaching young men how to preach, I go, speak up. Because if they can't hear you, they're not going to get a blessing. And speak in understandable words. Sometimes seminary education will make you start sounding like you're in tongues. I have no idea what he just said, right? So just being clear and intelligible. He goes, if people don't understand what you're saying, you, you might as well speak into the air. He goes, in fact, verse 10, there's many languages in the world, and, and they're not without meaning. But if I don't know the, the meaning, I shall be to the one who speaks. Now, he uses the word barbarian here, probably a foreigner. And one who speaks will be a foreigner to me. So his point is clarity is necessary. So since you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Seek that you say something clear. Like don't get up and say, I eschew obfuscation. Because nobody knows what you said. Does anybody know what I just said? Eschew means to hate, and obfuscation means being unclear. So I just said, I hate being unclear. Well, I was unclear, right? So he goes, just think about being clear in what you're going to say. So edification takes place when prophecy takes a priority. Clarity is necessary. Now, the third thing is he says, and this is really cool. For edification to take place, you need to have praise, prayer, and instruction. I like this. Praise, prayer, and instruction. If all you do is come to church, you know, let's get, the, let's get the music out of the way. I just come for the sermon. Like, no, <clears throat> not good. Okay, so let's look in verse 13. He says, therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now, I know that freaks people out. They're like, wait a minute. If you don't know what you're saying when you're praying in tongues, how can that help you? And I go, I don't know, but I'm okay with that. The Holy Spirit prays, and I don't know what it, he's saying either, but I'm okay with that, and I'm glad he does it. But Paul says, but the outcome is this. I'm going to pray with my spirit, but I'm also going to pray with my mind. But then he adds singing. Wait, singing? I shall sing with the spirit, and I shall sing with the mind also. So one of the things I want you to think about is when we get together, this is not just when we sing, that's just not the warm-ups, you know. Come on in 15 minutes late, you know, don't worry about the warm-ups. Just get here for the sermon. Like, no, no, no. Singing is not only a time that we worship God, but singing is a time when we grow and we learn and we, ready for this? We are corporately teaching one another. You're like, where's that in the Bible? Good question. Colossians chapter 3. Sing and make melody in your heart instructing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Kind of gives a new meaning to, yeah, I don't feel like singing today. Or I didn't get a whole lot out of the worship. Well, first of all, as D.A. Carson said, we weren't worshiping you. But number two, <laughs> when we're singing, it's not just worshiping God, but it's to one another. Some songs literally are to one another. Let us break bread together on our knees, right? 
Rise up, O church. You know, we're, we're calling each other. We're stirring each other up. So notice what Paul says. I'll sing with my mind. Novel thought for many Christians. They're like, I have no idea what the words of that song is, but man, it makes me feel so good. <clears throat> Bad idea. If you have no idea what the words of the song is, right? And some songs are frankly not good, like this one. You're the God of this city. Greater things are yet to come. I go, you think they sang that in Sodom and Gomorrah? How do I know greater things are yet to come in this city? God might nuke Langhorn for all I know. So think about the things that you're singing. And that's why I really appreciate Benjamin because while you might say, man, I want to see him break a guitar and bite a bird's head or something like, and I, I'm okay with that. Or, or maybe you want um, Jeremy to do some hip hop or whatever. I don't care what the, the venue is. It's the content, the, the message edifying, right? That, you know, I love hymns, but not because I like to go to the skating rink. Jesus is coming again. It's because of the content. The words really help me. They teach me. They remind me of Scripture truth. So, we have to have praise, prayer, and instruction. So, notice he says, I'll pray with my spirit, but then notice in verse 16, where do you get praise from? Where do you get the singing from? Verse 16, otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only... How will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't know what you're saying? Now, man, that verse could be a whole sermon on that, but a couple things. Blessing and giving thanks. So they allowed time during the service for people to stand up and bless God and give thanks. Now, if I wanted to try to justify our weakness in our gathering, I could say, well, we do that too on Thanksgiving once a year, right? So it was normal when Christians got together that they had a time of singing rich praise to God and then people could stand up and bless God and they could give thanks to God. They could say, the Lord brought me out of this. They would read a psalm, my soul was in the pit, but the Lord lifted me out of that. And guess what happened? After the one person gave a praise, then the other people would say, amen. So all this time when Pastor Thompson would say, could I get an amen? You're like, oh, he's such a Baptist. And I go, no, I'm just a Bible follower. Because that's what they did. People would give a word of praise, a testimony, and then other people would say amen. So Paul goes, if you get up and you give a word of praise in tongues, nobody knows what you're saying. How can they say amen? If I went, blah, 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 I hope you're not going to say amen. Because he's like, I don't know what he said. Now, interestingly, he also says, the guy who fills the place of the ungifted. You're like, what the heck is that? Who is the ungifted that he's talking about here? Well, there's a debate on this. Some have suggested, I disagree, that if unbelievers came in, they had a separate place to sit. So th this word, it's, it's kind of funny. It's, we get the word idiot from this Greek word. So if an idiot comes in, but it would be awkward to have like an idiot section, right? I mean, people would... But it didn't mean idiot back then. It meant uninstructed, untutored, and probably meant this, an unbeliever, right, who's a seeker. Now, I found this to be fascinating because I, I, I once pastored a church that had um, an Asian congregation at a later time during the day, and I was, I was joining them, and they would have meals regularly, and I'm sitting at a table, and they're like, this is my friend so-and-so, oh, and this, this is my friend so-and-so. They're not a Christian. They're a seeker right? Oh, this guy's not a Christian. He's a seeker. I'm like, are you allowed to do that? Like, would you, would you do that if we had a breakfast here and you go, hey, this is my friend Joe. This is Nancy. She's not saved. She's just here to find out about Jesus. Like, <laughs> what do we do with that, right? But that, they, so, so they understood that some people who were coming to church were inquirers, okay? And frankly, we see this all the time, and I thank God for it. I'm so grateful every time someone comes in and goes, hey, I've come from the Catholic Church, or I, I haven't gone to church in years, or, you know, I'm really interested in learning about the Bible. So we have to bear in mind there are usually people who are not yet believers in the midst. And Paul goes, what good is it if they can't hear you? He says in verse 17, you're giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. Then he says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all, but I think he means in my prayer time. However, in the church... When I'm gathered with other Christians, which, by the way, somebody once said, don't tell Paul that a building's not a church, because he goes, in the church, you're like, you're not allowed to say that. So probably he means here, because this word could be translated, with the church, 
I desire to speak five words with my mind. Now, ready for this? That I may instruct others. So that's why this point is this. When Christians gather, there should be praise, prayer, and instruction, right? How many of you ever went to catechism? You're like, I still have nightmares from it. Catechism, right? Well, actually, the Greek word catechize is used in the Bible, and it's a good thing to instruct people in the basics of the Christian faith. What is repentance? What is the gospel? What's the purpose of baptism? How do I know whether I can lose my salvation? What is the Holy Spirit? How does he work in my life? So, so anytime somebody shares something that's instructing others in the, in the truth of the gospel, that's a good thing, all right? So we're almost done here. He says, so here's what we're going to do. When you get together, communicating prophecy should take priority. Clarity is necessary. Make sure you have prayer, praise, and instruction. And then he, then he, then he, then he throws a curveball, and he goes, and guess what? You can actually evangelize people through prophecy. Now, this is really cool. So he's going, I, there's going to be unbelievers there. So let's start in verse 20. He goes, brothers, don't be children in your thinking. In other words, please, you're, you're prioritizing tongues. Stop it. That's immature. In evil, be babes. So there is one place that God wants us to be like babies, and that is when it comes to evil. The Bible says, be wise of what's good and innocent of what's evil. If I hear this one more time, I'm going to throw up. It's a really good movie, except for the cursing, the blasphemy, the nudity, and the violence. Other than that, it's a really good movie. Like, maybe we could all say, no, I don't need to read this article. I don't need to listen to this news thing. I don't need to hear this joke. Like, in evil, you're like, well, I need to know what they're doing. No, you don't. Ephesians chapter 5 says it's a disgrace to speak of the things that are done by godless believers in secret. So that's a good thing. Sometimes I go, I, when somebody's trying to tell, a, uh, I shouldn't tell this joke. And I go, don't, because I got enough garbage in my mind. I'm trying to get out. I don't need any more input. But then he says this. <clears throat> in the law, it's written by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people. And even so, they won't listen to me, says the Lord. Now, he quotes from Isaiah when God said he was going to judge the Jews because they wouldn't repent. And a sign of that was he's going to send the Assyrians in and they're going to be speaking another language. And you would think that the, that the Jews would repent, but they wouldn't. They didn't. And so he says, so then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Now, here's where for years I misunderstood this verse. Because of what I read in Acts chapter 2, I assume that what he meant by this is the primary purpose of tongues is to evangelize unbelievers. But I've come to think that's not what he means here when he says tongues are a sign to unbelievers. In fact, in the context of when that passage was spoken, he basically says, I'm going to speak to these people in signs. It's a sign of judgment, and it's just going to go right by. They're not even going to see it. They're not even going to get it. They're not going to respond to it. So actually, it seems to me that the opposite is the case. He's not saying here um, tongues is what gets people saved. I think it's a sign to their disadvantage that, hey, here's a sign that you're being judged. So I don't think he's saying Oh, when you get together, be sure to speak in tongues so unsaved people can get saved. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, let's look at the next verse. If indeed his primary goal was to say, use tongues to evangelize lost people, then he must have forgot he said that. Look at verse 23. If the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, he goes, ungifted men. Now, that's another word for for seekers or unbelievers will enter and they'll say that you're mad, you're nuts, you're maniacs, you're crazy. So he's not saying the best way to evangelize unbelievers is speak in tongues. He goes, no, don't speak in tongues in front of unbelievers to try to evangelize them. But rather, he says in verse 24, if all prophesy where you're sharing God's word, you're sharing God's work in your life. Now imagine this. An unbeliever's sitting there, and he's watching the Christians stand up one by one. This is what the Lord has done in my life. I want to praise God for this. Hey, could you pray for me? Hey, the Lord is, is put in my heart. There's somebody here that needs to hear this, right? And an unbeliever's watching all that. And then maybe, maybe somebody says, God really convicted me. I've been struggling with this sin. And there's an unbeliever listening going, wow, I struggle with that sin. Wait, 
Are they talking to, is he talking to me? I've had to, probably have said this to me. Tom, you at my house this week, because you were speaking right to me. And I'm going, don't shoot the messenger. I didn't have you in mind. Although sometimes I do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so look what he says. He says, if, if you prophesy and an unbeliever enters, he's convicted by all. He's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. In other words, think about this. From the beginning, you know what our natural tendency to sin is? When you're sinning, you hide from God. Our dad did that, Adam, right? And from that day forward, that's the natural thing to do. When you're sinning, you hide from God, you hide from others. And some people are very comfortable there. They love darkness rather than light. But when God's working in your heart and you gather with un unbelievers or Christians and they're talking about God delivering them from their sins and it's not okay to keep living in your sins, suddenly the secrets of your heart are exposed. And then they do this. Look, they fall on their face and they worship God declaring, God is certainly among you. Now, can you imagine that? Wow, can you imagine that unbelievers would come into Riverstone and say, man, one thing I, I sensed when I was in there is that God was there. God was there. This stuff is real. I had a, a little bit of that experience. I grew up in a Methodist church. We never preached from the Bible, right? Everybody just sat down and went home. But I went to a little tiny Bible church in Deptford, New Jersey. And I was like, something's different here. These people are reading the Bible. They're singing like they mean it. They remembered my name. They're showing me love. So be conscious of that, that when unbelievers are in our presence, we can evangelize them through the things that we say and share. So here's the application. Paul says in verse 26, what's the outcome? When you assemble, so his point is, be prepared to speak to others. When you assemble, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, and an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now, the difficulty here is, how do we do this, Tom? Like, should I say, okay, it's 10.14, we have one minute left. Okay, let's take turns. Who has something to share? So here's the thing. We can't do it in a setting this large. So while this is an important part of your Christian development, it is only a part, right? It's kind of like you got this part of your diet, but you still need to have this. So the more we, we multiply and grow here, the more we need to divide into smaller group settings. So you ready for this? Where's this most applicable? When you gather with your small group. Guess what we talked about in our Wednesday night small group last week? Okay, guys, next week, everybody come prepared to share something. Be reading the Word this week, reading the Psalms, praying, reading books, listening. Be prepared to come and share something that God wants someone else to hear. Tammy and I, when we were students at Cairn, we didn't know each other. We had an open time of sharing, and I stood up and said, Philippians 1, 6, God, who began a good work in you, will perform it in the day of Christ. Be encouraged. And Tammy told me later, she said, that really spoke to me. And I told her, no, you just liked me. <laughs> no, I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. No, she really did. She said, this person shared that. So the idea is, it's not just one talking head, Pastor Tom, Pastor Austin, Pastor John, Pastor Jeremy. It's all of us as we gather. So as we go home, a couple things. Number one, prioritize loving people and communicating the word to them, okay? Just ask God, Lord, give me something to share with, with someone. It's amazing. Like when you're reading the Psalms, instead of going, Lord, just give me something for me, think about, wow, this person probably could really use that which means you're getting to know one another in your group. Hebrews 10 says, think about how you can stimulate one another. So as you get to know one another, hey, I thought this would be encouraging to you, or I thought maybe this would be instructive to you, or I need to encourage you to exhort you, okay? So prioritize loving in the Word. And then be intentional. Like, be intentional about thinking, hey, even as we leave here, Hey, how you doing? Go Phillies. Well, actually, you wouldn't say that right now. You wouldn't say go Phillies. You'd be like, pray for the Phillies. But instead of, keeping, <laughs> instead of keeping it on the surface level and say, hey, can you pray for my neighbor? Their refrigerator's broken. Like, hey, what can I pray for you this week? You know, oh, I got a bunion, my diverticulitis, my arthritis, my gingivitis. How about, you know, I haven't prayed for a week or I'm struggling in my marriage or could you pray that I could get along better with my kid 
or my spouse is an addict, or, or, or I'm struggling with this sin. Could you pray for me? There's just this openness of sharing. Do you feel me like, does this sound like an alien? Or does this sound like, well, I just prefer to come and listen to a sermon and go, that was nice, go home. And you're like, well, that might be your preference, but you're not gonna grow in that setting. You're not gonna become mature and complete. So, I'll just say it once more. God's goal is for us to build each other up through spirit-led. So just be praying, Lord, you've given gifts of the spirit. Show me somebody to share something with. Encouragement through spirit-led, gospel-centered communication, okay? So don't, don't just walk up to somebody and say, turn that frown upside down, but give them a word from the Lord. Give them something from Scripture, okay? Gospel-centered communication and, and target this, that Christians are being built up and unbelievers are being brought to Christ. That's what we can pray for, amen? And that's why I hope before you leave, you'll be like, hey, you know, I've never met you, or hey, how can I pray for you? Or hey, are you in a small group? And, and those of you that want to, let us know. We want to get you connected. All right, let's pray together. Thank you for your word, Father. It's really encouraging. And even though we can't do some of this in the early church, and I'm sure there are more questions that I'd be happy to talk about in, in regards to these gifts. Just help us to be very centered on Scripture. And I pray that people who are here today heard what they needed to hear. Some needed to be convicted of their sin. Some of them right now need to, to just realize, hey, God is here, and I want Him, and I want to stop hiding from Him, and I want to bring the secrets of my heart to light so I can get help. Please, Lord, make this church a place of spiritual growth and, and, and community and love and upbuilding of the saints. Thank you for the working of the Holy Spirit. And as we have these focus meetings, may the Holy Spirit lead us. And if there are people who are hurting today, may they, may they just be ministered to by somebody. Just send us all from this day that we get up out of our seat, intentionally looking for someone that we can pray for, encourage, and build up in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great day and be in prayer for one another.